Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Oregon Office of Rural Health. I'm Rondi Engers, the RHC Program Manager. This is the fourth workshop in a five workshop series on leadership development titled, Tell Me More About That, How Being Curious Makes You a Better Leader. In today's workshop, Lauren Harris from Healthcare Consulting will talk to us about resilience, relationships, compassion, and COVID. This is a workshop, so we would love your participation. We also hope this gives you an opportunity to connect with other, other RHC leaders across the state. Once the workshop series is complete, please take the opportunity to schedule a one on one coaching session with Lauren to ensure you take action on next steps or drill down on a leadership topic to improve your skills. If you are interested in scheduling a coaching session, send an email to me or better yet, enter your email in the chat box. I will send you the details on scheduling. The Office of Rural, of Rural Health has about 10 scholarships available to cover the cost of the coaching session, and I've only had one response. So, Tashina, um, send me your email if you're interested. I mean, you can chat with Lauren about anything. Anyway, Lauren is passionate about medical practices and enjoys partnering with them to see them succeed. After years of honing her skills within large and small organizations of multiple, multiple specialties, including RHC and school-based health centers, she started her own consulting practice in July of 2020. She partners directly with practitioners and leaders to provide business and operation expertise. Lauren started her healthcare management career in 1992 and achieved her MGMA CMPE certification in 2008 and her FACMPE certification in 2013. Before I begin, I have a few housekeeping details. This workshop webinar will be recorded. Eric Jordan will post the slides and recording on the Office of Rural Health website within the next few days. Thank you to Eric, who is our tech support during the workshop. If you encounter technology problems, enter your questions in the chat box, and he will be happy to assist you. You are all currently muted and can unmute yourself to speak. You can also enter your questions into the chat box. Your video can remain on or off. That's totally up to you. Lauren will be happy to answer your questions at any time and welcomes your comments. Lauren. The screen is yours. All right, thank you, Rondian. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to today's topic. I've spent a lot of time doing research and hope to share some practical tools and things with you today. But the first thing that I want to do is invite you to start off with me um, looking at today's objectives. And what we're going to do is identify what resilience is and how to practice it. I'd like you to be able to understand the value of work relationships and how to create and build them, to learn some techniques for knowing and taking care of ourselves, and to understand what compassion is and how to practice it with ourselves and with others. So I'd like to invite you to take just a minute with me to do a little mindfulness exercise. And we're doing this today to help ourselves get grounded in the conversation and also that this is a tool you might want to implement in your personal life or your work life. So I'm just going to invite you to get comfortable in your seat and place your feet on the floor, relaxing your arms and your hands by your side or maybe on the armrests of your chair. Breathe in slowly and deeply for four counts. So one, two, three, four. Hold, breathe out slowly for five counts. One, two, three, four, five. We're going to do that again. So in one, two, three, four, hold, and out two, three, four, five. And I'd like you to listen to all the sounds around you. Try to identify each one and name it to yourself silently. Maybe you hear the buzzing of your computer or you hear some voices down the hall in your office. Focus on what those are for just a moment. Just name what it is and let it go.
Now focus on feeling the ground beneath your feet. Feel that seat that's in the chair beneath your thighs. And feel what's beneath your hands. Is it your desk, your lap, the armrest of your chair? Is your chair hard or soft? Focus on it, how each surface feels beneath your fingertips. Now focus on your breath once again. We're going to breathe in slowly for four, two, three, four, hold, and out, two, three, four. Now I'd like you to think about something that went well either this morning or this week. It could be a great interaction you had with a family member or a coworker or something that you really succeeded at when you worked on it this morning. Hold that just in your mind for a moment. Now go ahead and smile and open up your eyes. Hopefully that was a brief little exercise that helps you focus on what's going on around you, rounding yourself in your chair and in the conversation that we're gonna have today about resilience. So what is resilience and why does it even matter? Well, it's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness. It's the ability of a substance or an object to spring back into shape. That's the spring you see on the slide today. It can be elasticity. It's the ability to respond, absorb, and adapt to as well as recover from a disruptive event. This is a quote from the Wall Street Journal from um, the president, vice president of Johns Hopkins Medicine. He said, resilience is about how we acknowledge, respond to, and rise above chaos, and how we act on the other side of that disruption. And another way to think about it is that it's about having the capacity to intentionally change before the need to change forces it to happen. So it's about making a choice. And I'd like to introduce you to a tool here, or a visual example of what resilience can look like in, in the resilience cycle. And this is from a doctor named Dr. Uh, Deborah Gilboa, or she called herself Dr. G. And she has created this graphic that really spoke to me, so I wanted to share it with you. And what we do is we start at the top at that change box. And changes we know causes pain, discomfort, loss, there's always a loss of something, someone, or even some familiarity. So that change leads to that loss box in the blue, and that leads to distrust, which is denial. And that could last a minute or days or weeks or even longer. But as we move out of that dist distrust level, we move into discomfort. And that's where we start to accept the hard, the new, the awkward, and we start to look for ways to manage that discomfort. And as we do that, we create choice. And choice is really what creates resilience. So if you think about it, change is often something that happens to us, but the ability to make a choice about how we respond to that change is what allows us to bounce forward, let's say, from that change. And it creates a sense of control. And that sense of control is what gives us engagement. And engagement doesn't necessarily mean we're happy about it um, or that we're not frustrated about it anymore, but that engagement allows us to move forward into what she calls reunification. And that means that you're rejoining a group or a relationship or getting back to your real self. So I like to think of that as finding stability again. And we go through this every time we experience change. And as we think about last year and the many, many changes that we've gone through, and even in the seat that you're sitting in right now, you're probably going through some of this. So I wanted to invite you to type in the chat where you are in the resilience cycle right now. And you could be in multiple places depending on the change. I'm gonna invite you to say where you are if you're comfortable. And I'm unable to see the chat. So, Rondian, if you can share that with me, that would be great.
Lauren, there's nothing at this time. Okay, that's all right too. If you want to internalize this and just think to yourself, that's completely fine. I'd like to talk about some ways that you can actually practice resilience. And I like to think of this as taking a brain break. So some ways that you might take a brain break are to practice a short meditation like we just did. You might also focus on eating lunch in a calm environment, getting away from your busy desk or your busy office. What about listening to your favorite song? That's a great way to take a brain break. Focusing on your breath for 30 or 60 seconds, like we just did even. Text a friend, make a connection with someone that you haven't spoken to for a while. Watch a fun video. There's a reason that YouTube is full of cat videos and fun and silly things and TikTok and all of those great resources that we have now to find entertainment for ourselves. Play a game. There's nothing wrong with playing a game on your little phone or your computer or playing a real game with someone that you enjoy spending time with. Take a walk. Listen to a podcast. All of those are great ways to help you take a brain break from all of the amazing amounts of information and stress that we feel every day. And one of the things that I find is that we can get into a space where we're feeling anxious about something that's happening either to us or that's upcoming in our lives. So I wanted to give you some framework to ask yourself some questions if you're starting to feel anxious. And this comes from Carpenter Smith Consulting. I love this. Ask yourself, what are you afraid of in this situation? And our brains are wired for fear. Fear is what has historically kept us alive and kept us safe. And that's the number one job of our brain is to keep us safe. So what we know is that the thing that most often derails people is fear and the many ways that it shows up for us. So if you think about what you typically do when you feel fear, we all have responses that can vary based on the circumstances, but we know that they usually become a pattern. And if you think about when you become afraid, how do you know it? What happens for you? Can you feel your heart start to race? Do you feel your face flush? Uh, do you feel that sort of sense of I need to get away? Some people go to a place of toughness where they want to let everyone know how much bravado they can demonstrate. Other people get really analytical or they withdraw. And some people um, respond in more of a, what appears to be a calm or a Zen space, but really it's them sort of ruminating on all the things that can be happening or going wrong. So think about yourself and how you typically respond when you feel fear. And then ask yourself, what would you do if you felt safe in the moment? So contrast your fear with how you show up when you feel at your best. This allows you to focus on those moments and to build on that energy. And especially when you're interacting with other people whose behavior you can't control, focus on controlling your own responses, your own breath, your own, um, how, how you go to your own problem solving Space when you feel safe. I also really liked this graphic and Susan David, who is the author of Emotional Agility, which is a fantastic book, she talks about the word anxious as being an umbrella term. And really what it is, is it's covering up more specific terms for us, things like afraid, confused, stressed, vulnerable, skeptical, worried, cautious, nervous. And if you go beyond that obvious umbrella term of I feel anxious, you can dive down a little deeper into what that is actually meaning for you. And the other thing that she talks about that's been really meaningful for me is to focus on thinking I am feeling, not I am anxious. So instead of thinking of your emotion as something that you are, think of it as something that you feel. And that allows you to build a bridge between those two things. And to not own it quite so deeply. So here's some suggestions on how to reset your nervous system and increase your resilience when you're going through a high stress event or a high anxiety event. Bring to mind a person, a place, a pet, or a strong personal quality 
that brings you strength or joy. So think about that thing for just a moment. If you hold that thing in your mind's eye while paying attention to that pleasant sensations that come up, you'll start to notice how your breathing slows down, your heart rate slows down, and your muscle tension releases. So your shoulders might actually drop. This is a great way to take a moment and just be conscious of something that's positive when you're starting to feel that stress. I also wanted to share with you something called a feelings wheel. And Gloria Wilcox created this as a chart, which is designed to help people quickly and easily identify the specifics of their emotional state. So emotions, as we know, can be incredibly nuanced and finding that right word to express that feeling can be really challenging. We often get stuck in that inner circle of saying something like, I'm angry, or I, I feel fearful, or I feel happy. But if you use a feelings wheel like this, it can help you understand your experiences and the emotional states and express yourself more effectively to get the support that you need from your loved ones or your coworkers. So I wanted to encourage you to look at this tool and think about how you might use it in your life. So as you can see, each one is color coded. So if we start with, I feel happy, that again is the umbrella word that then dives down into the more specifics. So happy might also mean I feel playful or interested or proud or accepted. And then you can dive even deeper. So I feel happy because I feel accepted. And that means that I feel respected and valued. I love this. And I thought this was a great thing to print out and keep on your desk or to help your coworkers understand and dive a little deeper into their emotional state if they come to you and say, I'm angry about something. Okay, let's dive a little deeper. What does that mean? Why do you feel angry? What is really driving that? Maybe you feel let down because you feel betrayed or resentful of something that's occurred. So this will be available in, in the PowerPoint and you can also um, Google this. It's just a feelings wheel from Gloria Wilcox. You can download a copy of it. One thing I've noticed that we also do is we spend some time in negative self-talk and we often talk to ourselves in ways that we wouldn't talk to our family or our best friends. Um, and so I wanted to encourage you to use this tool from Ann Grady Group about ways to convert what you might say to yourself, something like, I'll never be able to do this, into I'm doing the best I can right now. Or I'm not very good at this and I'm going to fail. Think about saying instead, I've accomplished so much already. Or from this is too hard for me, to I know I'm capable of doing this. Or others will think I'm stupid. Instead, think I will figure this out. And again, if we reframe these conversations that we have with ourselves into what would you say to your best friend or to a loved one, frequently we find that we wouldn't talk to them the same way that we talk to ourselves. So here's some great examples on how to avoid that negative self-talk. I wanted to give you some examples too and how you might ground yourself. So if you find yourself feeling like too many emotions are sort of swirling or your anxiety is feeling like it's raised in a particular situation, I like the idea of swiping your thoughts away. So if you just close your eyes and you think about swiping from picture to picture on Instagram or some other app, we do that with our finger all the time. You could even close your eyes and swipe that thought into a different one. You could send well wishes to three people in your life. And sometimes this means doing it in an email or a text. Sometimes it means just thinking of that person and focusing on three things or three different people that you would wish well and why. Sometimes we get stuck on the big picture and the next step is really just to focus on what is the next small step I can take to move myself forward. Again, thinking about what you would tell a friend instead of what you might say to yourself, because we can be really hard on ourselves. I like this idea, too, of just closing your eyes and visualizing a stop sign. And you can add a physical motion to that, too, of closing your eyes and just thinking, stop. I'm going to stop myself from swirling and move on to this next space. And going to your favorite place in your mind. So is that the beach? Is that the woods? Is that a particular place in your home where you love to sit and read or feel comfortable? 
Think about that place for just a moment. You can visualize your feet as part of the earth. And when we think about being grounded, that is a, a literal manifestation of that. Gravity is pulling us down to the surface of the earth. And then as we talked about before, reaching out to a friend or a family member if you start to feel overwhelmed or anxious or have difficulty coping in a particular situation. I wanted to share this idea too, that what if you changed your thinking in a stressful situation from why did this happen to me to why did this happen for me? It's a completely different mindset and a completely different shift of feeling like the victim instead of, instead of feeling like the victim to feeling like the receiver of a gift. What if what's occurring is actually going to help you move forward in some way, or it's a gift for you to be thinking about something in a slightly different way? So now I want to talk a little bit about relationships and in particular work relationships. So how can we focus on creating strong work relationships and creating psychological and social safety? Well, the more that we show appreciation and respect for others, we can deepen those relationships. If we focus on speaking well of our team members and encouraging the other folks on our team to do the same, we can create that sense of safety. If you focus on careful listening, and this is a hard one for a lot of us, especially extroverts like me, where we're always sort of thinking about the next thing we're going to say. If we take a moment and instead focus on what's really being said to us and what the meaning is behind that, we can create connection with others more easily. Being positive, so focus on the, the best side of things, the best side of people. This is a great one too. develop trust with your colleagues by keeping their confidences and keeping your word. So if you say you're going to do something, do it, follow through, um, let people know that they can trust you. And this is a great one that I think we often miss. It's creating team focused goals and accountability. We frequently focus on our individual goals, but we don't often think about the greater team focused goals and celebrating when we achieve those and creating accountability for the entire team. I encourage you to do that. And then also maintaining consistent communication is really important. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So thinking about some meaningful conversation starters, where, where do you begin? How do you get to know people and create that psychological safety? This is one of my very favorites, and I think we've talked about this before, but if you start a conversation with your team with what's going well instead of what's wrong today or what's broken or what are we missing, this just completely reframes the conversation and it allows people to spend a moment and actually think about hey, something went well today, or something is going well. And I love doing this if you start with a huddle in the morning with your team, go up to them, make this the icebreaker of the morning, and then dive into what's broken or what needs changing. Um, it can really change the energy in the room. Also asking, what are you grateful for right now? Allows us to spend a moment and focus on that. Again, what gifts do we have? What are we experiencing right now that we can be grateful for? What are you reading right now? This is always a fantastic question. I'm amazed by the, the things that I hear from people and I learn about people about topics they're interested in or um, different techniques and tools that they're learning. Poking someone to what are you passionate about right now? So if you think about these as not only team building questions, but sort of opportunities when you're meeting someone new, instead of asking someone, what do you do for a living? Or where do you work? What if you ask them, what are you passionate about? Wouldn't that be fun? Think about the different layers of, of knowledge you would get about each other if you start with a question like that. This is a good one too. What did, what's something that you learned about yourself last year? We all went through a lot of change and I think we can all stop and think for a moment about something that we learned about ourselves. Be very insightful to share that with one another. And this is a, a great one too. What is something that you're proud of lately? This allows someone the opportunity to brag for a moment. 
And that's really empowering. We don't spend a lot of time doing that or to ask our coworkers or our friends to do that with us. So I've got some ways here that you can help your team become more resilient as well. And one of the first things is making sure that you have an informal check-in every day. So you're going to notice when someone is missing or notice when someone isn't their usual self. And contact individuals um, with a personalized message, not just an all-company email. I think we tend to fall back on sending an email and sending a group email that um, is supposed to connect us with one another. And emails are great for sharing information and sharing things that we all need to know, but they're not great for connecting teams. So if you reach out to people as an individual, you're going to be much more likely to build that trust um, across the team. And this is so true. Communicate and then communicate some more. So communicate everything. Communicate plans, bad news, good news, anything. The major problem with withholding information is that people create their own stories. So one thing that I learned early on when we started to be faced with COVID last spring and I was working with the clinic was if we didn't tell them every day what we were doing and what we were planning, people created their own interesting stories, let's say, about what they thought was happening. And even if we didn't have an answer, if we simply communicated with individuals and teams that we were working on it, we don't have an answer yet, this is what we're researching, this is what we do know, it created a huge sense of safety and really alleviated a lot of the anxiety and stress that people were experiencing. So if you think you're communicating enough, you're probably still not. <laughs> Communicate some more. And one other thing about communication, the, the more you can do that in person or even via video chat, if you don't have your team on site, that is so much more effective again than sending an email or sending a text. It allows for you to see the person's response um, it allows for you to respond in a more timely manner, and um, I think it makes all the difference in the world to be able to see each other's faces in, in conversation if you can. And then focus on keeping feedback lines open. So really encouraging what's working and what isn't, and asking others to make suggestions to make things work better. So encouraging that feedback loop. This is a good one, too, to make sure that you're treating everyone equitably and not necessarily equally. And what that means is equal refers to sameness or likeness regarding particular or general attributes. But in contrast, equitable means treating someone fairly, justly, or proportionately. So think about the difference in your mind. And recognize the diverse set of circumstances that everyone is facing in their personal lives. And be flexible when you can be. There's a lot going on for people outside of work that we don't necessarily know about unless we ask or we get to know each other. Be patient. Changes in policies, workflows, and staff, they take time. And we're going to make mistakes. So encourage others to be kind to one another when adapting to change. Normalize failure and expect it. This is so true. We often will just say this is the new workflow, this is the new change, this is the policy, and we expect people to adopt it perfectly on the first try. Remember that everybody's human and that failures are gonna happen and mistakes are gonna happen. Normalize that, expect that, talk about it, think about, okay, how might we fail in this circumstance and what are we gonna do when, when it happens? Expect it. And encourage tolerance and empathy. So give each other some room to express our differences, to vent to one another, and give each other space to have a bad day once in a while. That's, I think, a really big deal. We don't always give each other grace and assume the best when someone's having a bad day. So let's talk a little bit about conflict and about reaction versus response. So reactions are instant. That's something that's driven by our beliefs, our internal biases, prejudices of our unconscious mind, whereas responses, they come more slowly. They're more calculated. They're based on information that we have from both the conscious and the unconscious mind. A response is intentional where a reaction is automatic. 
So think about when you're faced with stress, ways that you might be more responsive and less reactionary. And then I also wanted to share with you some phrases that can help diffuse conflict because we know conflict is part of interpersonal relations. This can be just conflict with your coworkers, conflict with patients, conflict with your family or your friends. So let's take a breather before we think this through. That is a great phrase that really says, sometimes it's best if we take a break. The word breather is really deliberate and it gives pause to the situation and gives everyone involved a chance to take a few deep breaths. Thank you for your candor. I appreciate your feedback. Most people who tell the truth, they don't get appreciated for it. And the best way to resolve conflict is to remain open to all types of feedback because oftentimes resolution involves that people feel safe in telling the truth like it is. Tell me more. I want to understand. This is one of my very favorite phrases. I love to use this. And while most people speak to be heard, very few people take time to understand. I'll let that sink in. And this phrase is really powerful because everyone just wants to be understood. It doesn't mean that you agree necessarily, just that you're willing to hear them out. Let's see what we can do to make sure this doesn't happen again. This one expresses concern for the work without placing blame. And you shift the discussion really from a defensive back and forth one to a prevention focused exploration. What can we do to change this situation? The important word in this one is we. So it's not about necessarily what you can do or what you can tell them to do. It's about we signaling the collaboration. And instead of saying that there's a hierarchy here and I'm expecting you to solve the problem or you're expecting me to solve the problem. It's really about the collaboration involved. Sometimes it's appropriate to just say, yes, you're completely right. And if you're miles apart on a conflict, finding something that you can agree on um, can really help you move the conversation forward. And this allows people to feel heard and validated, and they're more likely to engage in a constructive conversation. And sometimes, we did make a mistake and sometimes something did go badly wrong and it's totally appropriate to agree with that and say, yes, you are right and I understand and I hear you. I wasn't aware of this, tell me more. Here's that tell me more again, but it's sometimes really validating to the person that you're talking to, to just stay your ignorance and say, you know, I didn't understand that or I didn't know that or you taught me something new today. And that really lets the other person know that you're interested in what they're saying. And keep asking questions and listening empathetically until you get to the root of the conflict. Does anyone have a favorite one of these that they want to put in the chat? Something that you use now or that you'd like to use in the future? My personal favorite, tell me more. I love that, I use that one all the time. Yeah, Rondiana agrees, tell me more. <laughs> Thank you. So how to have difficult conversations and take care of yourself when you don't know what to say. And maybe you have an event coming up with your family or a work meeting um, that you know could involve conflict. And this will give you some ideas about how to anticipate what can happen and prepare for your triggers. So think about what those are. Are there certain words that you're anticipating or facial expressions or tone of voice from that one person that you know always triggers you in that way? Plan your script. Decide how you want to manage situations before they happen. And sometimes this means setting clear expectations before seeing people or going someplace. So in other words, sometimes we have certain family members that we know might say something that's gonna trigger us and we only wanna spend a certain amount of time with them before we know that we've reached our capacity of, of being resilient in that situation. It's okay to say, hey, I'm willing to come and visit you right now, but we're gonna visit outside where I feel safe and setting that boundary. Or I'm gonna be able to drop by for just a few minutes. And again, we'll meet up out in the driveway 
um, but I don't feel comfortable coming inside and spending an hour or two with you. This is a really important one right now as we're talking about things like asking people in line at the grocery store to step back a few feet. To say that you have that line or that boundary is empowering. And it's very um, important for you to think about what those situations might be before you get in them so that you've developed a script for yourself. And it's okay to acknowledge that sometimes that feels really hard and you might not get it right the first time or the first or second time. But to think about how you might practice those opportunities where you know you're gonna feel uncomfortable um, and to have that script in your pocket can feel really empowering. And again, thinking about setting those boundaries and being clear in those. So I think we can all agree that building healthy relationships starts with knowing and taking care of ourselves. So I wanna give you some tips on how to do that. Regularly nourish your soul. And what I mean by that is if walking in nature is what fills you with peace, do that. If a bowl of your favorite recipe lifts your spirits, go for it. Right now, everybody's just sort of doing the best they can. And the closest that we can come to thriving some days is just intentionally doing what makes us happy. So take that bubble bath, play with your kid, oh, get a massage, do some yoga, read a good book. Um, you know yourself best, and only you can honor that inner wish to have that momentary bliss. So maybe make a list for yourself of those things that nourish you and be ready to use them as tools when you need them. Express gratitude. So some ways to do that are to start a gratitude journal. I know a lot of folks like to do that. Um, you could send a thank you text to someone that you just happen to think of that moment and you want to share that with them. Think of three things that you're grateful for in this moment, and they can be big, they can be small. Sometimes it can just be as easy as, I'm really grateful for this bottle of water right now. I like hint water and I have a blackberry flavor next to me. It can be grateful for, I have a roof over my head. I have a job. I have all of these things um, that are making my life better right now. If we frame our lens on what we're grateful for, it can completely change how we feel when the tough things come along. Stay connected. So calling that friend, texting that family member, setting up a Zoom call or a Google Teams call or whatever, or a Microsoft Teams call, cuddling with your partner, your pet. Connection makes us feel seen and heard and like we belong in this really chaotic world. And it's very important. And sometimes it's just about seeking acceptance in order to find that peace. So as we go through the grieving process of loss and change, as we talked about earlier, we can also focus on just what's in our sphere of control and what choices we are able to make and what we need to accept in that moment. Sometimes it's just accepting for now that we can't make a change and there's nothing we can do. But if we can make a step-by-step -step plan to move the needle on those things and then start to let go of the items that you can't control, you will feel much better about that particular situation. And practicing compassion. So I love this quote from the Dalai Lama. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. I think that is so true. And here's a great quote from the International Journal of Palliative Nursing. We define the term compassion to mean the sensitivity shown in order to understand another person's suffering, combined with a willingness to help and to promote the well-being of that person in order to find a solution to their situation. That is compassion in the healthcare uh, world exactly, but it's also just compassion in the real world. So, why is practicing compassion important? It helps us connect with others. It forges a bond and establishes trust. It demonstrates our humanity to one another and connects us to one another. And it helps others move forward. And the other thing I wanted to share is, is a story that I heard about compassion in COVID and consequences. 
So there was an employee who early in the pandemic, let's say last April, started to experience COVID symptoms and notified her boss that she wasn't feeling well and had a fever and needed to stay home from work. And the boss said, great, I've got this. Let me handle your work for a day or two and let you feel better. A day or two went by. The employee was still not feeling well. We were in that time when we knew we needed to quarantine people who potentially had COVID. We were in the time when tests weren't readily available. And that employee said, you know what? I really am convinced here that I need to stay home and that I need to quarantine myself and I'm still running a fever and I need your help, boss. And the boss responded with, okay, I understand. Um, you know, those thermometers aren't always accurate. Perhaps you don't really have a fever. Um, I hope you feel better soon, but please let me know as soon as you can return to work. Wow. Do you think for a moment that that employee felt supported? Do you think that that was the right way for that manager to respond? Well, of course not. And looking back on that situation, I think that manager understands now too that that wasn't the right way to respond because there were some pretty significant consequences. That employee who had been a top performer in that organization lost complete trust and relationship with that boss and they left their position. So not only is compassion the right thing to do, it can have consequences if we don't practice it with one another. And I wanted to share that story just to say the humanity that we can express with one another is what ties us together. And that support that you have the opportunity to provide as leaders in your organization has a tremendous impact on your team and on your coworkers. And when you show up in a compassionate way, it makes a complete difference. If that boss had simply checked in with that employee and said something like, hey, I'm sure you're worried and I'm worried and how are you feeling today? And how can I help? And are there resources I can provide? And are you getting the care you need? The consequences and the outcome could have been very, very different. So there's the tie to compassion in COVID and hopefully a lesson that you don't have to learn the hard way by losing an employee or having someone leave your organization because they didn't feel connected on a human level. I also wanted to share this, which is the platinum rule. And I know we've all heard of the golden rule. And that's the one that says that we do unto others as we would have them do unto us. But the platinum rule, keeping in mind that platinum is more valuable than gold, says treat others the way they want to be treated. Those are two different rules with two different messages and they have two completely different effects. So think about how you might practice the platinum rule going forward. And as we're getting close to the end, I wanted to share a few resources here. So Greater Good in Action is a website and it's got science-based practices, meditations, reflections that really help you ground yourself in a meaningful life. And they're created by um, the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. So you might check that website out. Action for Happiness is another one of my favorites. And I'm gonna show you on the next slide, their monthly calendar. They have a calendar for March called Mindful March, and it has something to do each day, and they issue a new one each month. So you can go and download it, print it out, share it with your friends, put it on social media. Home is an app that you may or may not have heard of. I've gotten very into this one recently. It has meditations, music, and something that they call sleep stories. And Sleep stories are really cool. If you remember as a kid what it was like to be read to as you were falling asleep, it's that premise for adults and kids. They have sleep stories that are for adults and children. And I find them to be really soothing and just a great way to help relax your mind at the end of a busy day. So I highly recommend the Calm app if you don't have it and you're looking for tools and tips on how to learn to meditate or to help you fall asleep at night. Here is that calendar that I mentioned. So I wanted to show you that today's is stay fully present while drinking your cup of tea or coffee. And when I think about what fully present means, I think about that means really tasting whatever that is. 
thinking about the bitterness, the sweetness, the creaminess, if you add cream to your coffee like I do, um, all of the sensations that we can enjoy while we're drinking this particular cup of coffee or tea. If we look at yesterday's, it was get outside and notice how the weather feels on your face. We're having a nice spring day here. So I think this can be so grounding also and help you find that mindfulness practice that you're looking for. This is a really fun one. If you go to that website at the bottom, you can download each month and have that available. I like to post mine right here on my desk where I can look at it every day. And you, like I said, you can share it also on social media so that your friends can see it too. Here are some practical strategies for setting up some boundaries for yourself. So physical boundaries like using technology only when necessary um, and striving my, for mindfulness or being in the moment while working. And I like this one a lot, letting others know when you're available and how to contact you during those critical times when you're unavailable. That allows you to set up the boundary of I'm going to turn off my notifications in my email or I'm going to turn off the notifications in my phone. And if something really urgent happens, someone will, will be able to get reach me by being an emergency contact that will go through in my phone or some other mechanism. But being mindful about what each of these can look like to help you set up those physical, mental, and social boundaries or strategies for your own boundaries. One thing that I find is really distracting for myself is around email notifications. If I'm working on a project and my, you've got mail, little envelope pops up, I, my brain instantly goes, oh, you need to go read that. And of course I don't. Of course I can take a moment or five minutes or 15 minutes or even an hour and go back to that later. I think we need to be mindful um, and intentional about setting up those boundaries for ourselves so that we're not always responding like that dog in that movie to squirrel or email in my case. So lastly, I have a self-compassion exercise that we can go through. It'll take a few minutes, but I'd like you to try this with me and see how you feel. And you can also share this with people in your life. And there's the link to it right there. So close your eyes with me if you would. And think about a situation in your life that's difficult and causing you stress. Call that situation to mind and see if you can actually feel that stress and emotional discomfort in your body. Are you tensing up? Is your heart starting to race a little bit? Then say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. This acknowledgement is a form of mindfulness. It's Simply noticing what's going on for you emotionally in that present moment without judging is going to allow you to release that. You can even say to yourself, this hurts, or this is what stress feels like. Use whatever statement is most natural to you. Next, say to yourself, suffering is a part of life, or stress is a part of life. This is a recognition of your common humanity with everyone and that all people have trying experiences and these experiences give you something in common with the rest of humanity. It doesn't make you abnormal or deficient in any way. Another option for this statement is something like, other people feel this way, or I'm not alone, or we all struggle in our lives. Now put your hands over your heart and feel the warmth of your hands and the gentle touch on your chest. And say, may I be kind to myself. This is a way to express that self-kindness. You can also consider whether there's another specific phrase that speaks to you better in that situation. Some other examples are, may I give myself the compassion that I need. May I accept myself as I am. May I forgive myself. May I be strong. May I be patient. Take time to do that every once in a while when you're starting to feel yourself experience a lot of stress or anxiety and share this tool with others if you think it's helpful. There are some other fantastic ones available on this website here that's on the page. So 
I'd like to hear what one commitment is that you are willing to make today in order to increase your own resiliency or to help others increase theirs. If you're comfortable saying it out loud or typing something in the chat, that would be great. We have a shy group today. <laughs> well, hopefully there's at least one takeaway for you in this session that you can um, bring back to your, yourself, your work life, your home life, your team, your family, um, and ways for you to practice resiliency in your own life. So I wanted to spend a couple moments and talk about our final workshop, which is gonna be next week. We've been meeting every other week, so this one's gonna sneak up on us fast. And it's going to be called how to be your own consultant. And we have some uh, specific things we'll be talking about around categories that you should be familiar with in order to be your best as a practice manager or a practice leader. And we'll be pulling in some of the things we've talked about over the last four sessions as well. So that'll be next week, Thursday, March 18th from 12 to 1. And then I also just want to again invite you that if you're interested in one on one coaching, um, you can reach out to Rondi Ann and she can connect you with me. There are scholarships available so that that can be paid. And I invite you to connect with me via my website, my LinkedIn, my Facebook profile, if you have questions or would like to dive a little deeper into any of the things we've talked about over the last several weeks. And thank you for the privilege of getting to share with you today. I'm going to turn it back over to Rondi Ann. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you for, again, giving leaders this time to learn and grow. Um, on behalf of myself and the Oregon RHC leaders, thank you for this opportunity. Um, do you have any last minute comments? I don't. I just hope everyone can join us. And if they're interested in talking more one on one, I would love to have conversations with folks about how they can develop their, their own leadership skills more fully. Okay, thank you everyone and have thank a wonderful you. afternoon. It's sunshiny here in Eastern Oregon. Hopefully it's sunny where you guys are as well. Fantastic. Enjoy your day everyone. Thank you Twyla. I saw your message pop up. Take care.